is Brenda, and thanks for showing up. This talk is on Linux performance tools, and it's a quick tour of many tools that we can use for Linux performance analysis. I work at Netflix. Netflix does video streaming, and we just launched in Europe, which is really exciting. So we get to share our content with many new audiences. At Netflix, we have a massive Linux cloud on EC2, tens of thousands of instances, and performance is critical. Um, we have over 50 million subscribers. We actually have many cloud-wide performance analysis tools that we use that we've built in-house, but sometimes we have to log into the instances and run performance tools manually over SSH. And that's what this talk is about. When you get onto an instance or when you get onto a Linux server, and you need to understand things directly. Uh, my name is Brenda. Uh, I work as a senior performance architect at Netflix. And these days I'm doing a lot of Linux work. I've previously done work on other operating systems. And these slides I'm about to show you, I've just put them on Twitter uh, at Brendan Gray. So for this talk, I'm going to cover a lot of tools. I'm going to cover something like 30 or 40 tools. And the point of this is not so that you remember the switches to IS stat at the end of this talk, or you remember exactly how to uh, read the columns or this or that. The main point of this talk is to cover the landscape and so that you understand what tools exist. It's more important so that you know that something can be done than how to do it. Because if you know that something can be done, you can always look it up later, you can, you can use the internet, you can search for it, you can look up my slides. If you don't know it can be done at all, you never think to look for it, look for it later. So it's about turning unknown unknowns into known unknowns, which is very valuable. So I'll start by going through methodologies and tools. Uh, especially in a talk like this where I'm about to cover lots and lots of tools, you might think, and I was asked this yesterday, how do you know which tools to use, and how do you know to use one tool and then the next tool and the next tool? It's about performance methodologies that I follow. So there are dozens of performance tools, and uh, these methodologies provide guidance. They provide a starting point. They show you which tool to use next, and, and so on and so on, to root cause. Uh, I've been documenting methodologies for a while. I'm a big fan of them. Uh, I've also been documenting anti-methodologies, and so this is the lack of a deliberate methodology. The first would be the streetlight anti-method, which is where you pick observability tools that are familiar, found on the internet or at random, and you just run them and see if you can find obvious issues. Now if this works for you, that's great. I mean, at the end of the day, it's just about solving performance issues, but there are more efficient, more effective ways to go about doing it. There's also the drunk man anti-method, which is where you do, this is a different type of methodology. The first one's observability, and the second one is where we're tuning the system. We tune things at random until the problem goes away. Um, it's quite useful because I, I showed up to work one day after my co-workers had been tuning the system, and they immediately confessed and said, Brennan, we used the drunk man anti-method. That's how we found the tuner list. It's like, okay, now I understand. You just guess things at, at random. But um, it was helpful just to give that methodology a name so that we're all on the same page straight away. Uh, actual methodologies include things like the, the, there are many, and, and some of them you may already be familiar with. Workload characterization is a methodology that's been used for decades. And for workload characterization, that's where I just want to understand the load that's been applied to a target. And that might be IOPS and the rewrite mix, the type of operations, who the clients are. Very simple stuff, but when you actually look at it, then you realize that most of, the, most of the time, really dumb things are happening. And it's about fixing the dumb things that gives us the biggest wins. It's about eliminating unnecessary work. So uh, work like characterization is a very effective methodology. Once you have that in your head, you think, I'm going to do work like characterization, that then poses the questions that you find tools to answer. So if I'm looking at the CPUs, how do I do work like characterization of the CPUs, or of TCP IP, or of sockets? And so that's why these can be quite useful. The first one I've got there is one I created, the use method. Uh, for the use method, you create a functional diagram of the system showing the data path and the components. And then for every component, you look for three metrics only, which is utilization, saturation, and errors. And that's great because if you've, if you've looked at NetStat minus S and you've looked around uh, performance monitoring tools, there could be hundreds or thousands of performance metrics to pick through. Uh, this narrows it down to maybe 30 key metrics for your system. When you, once you identify the key resources, you only have three metrics for each resource. So it makes it much easier for you to more quickly do a broad check 
for the very simple issues, the bottlenecks and errors for learning fruit. I've thrown another one there, the five whys methodology, just because it's simple to summarize. That's where you ask why five times. So the CPUs are now hot. Why? Well, this, this application is using them. Why? Well, I profiled it, and this code path is on CPU all the time. Why? And so on and so on, until you get to the root cause. But like I said, there's many, um, there's many methodologies, and that's how, uh, that's how I end up choosing which tools to use, and it can be very valuable for you to I'm going to go through a lot of command line tools in this talk, and you might think, I'm not going to use these command line tools. We have this really nice GUI. That's what we're going to use. As it turns out, a lot of the metrics that you use, they come from the same kernel locations. So if you learn the command line tools, like things like ISTAT, VMSTAT, and SAR, you will find that you see the same metrics over and over and over. And if your company switches performance, application performance monitoring, GUIs, and you use something else, it's the same metrics. It comes from the same kernel locations. So it's very handy to learn them once, and you can learn them from the command line tools. I've uh, summarized tools into four different types, uh, and that is observability, benchmarking, tuning, and I've got a new type for this presentation, static performance tuning tools. Observability tools is, is where I can watch the active load of the system, and they're generally considered as safe, unless you have the observer effect where by watching it I'm I'm training too much over here. Benchmarking tools is where I'll do an experiment. Uh, I might be running iperf or FIO to, to investigate how a system performs. Ping is an, observer, is an experimental tool, a, a benchmarking tool. And then there's tuning tools where I actually change the state of the system and I need to be more careful about it. And then the last section, which I'll get to, is static performance tuning tools. So the first one is observability tools. And this is a functional diagram of the system, it's pretty simplistic, but it gives you a starting point where the question you want to ask is how do I observe each of these? And you may not know what you're looking for, but simply the act of observing, say workload characterization, what are each of these components doing, often will identify problems. I'll go through these very quickly to start with, so basic tools. So uptime, uptime is uh, I only use it to print out the load averages. I only really look at load averages for about five seconds because they're not terribly useful, but they are kind of useful. Uh, these print out the 1, 5, and 15 minute exponentially dead to moving averages. The 1, 5, and 15 minutes are constants in the equation. They're not actually 1, 5, and 15 minute averages, but they're roughly of that time span. Um, you look at the three numbers because it can tell you straight away if load is getting, if things are getting busier or if things are getting quieter on the system. Uh, think of, uh, I mean, these things date back to the 1970s, the, the, the triplet of load averages. Think of if you had a text-based display only and you needed to do some historical analysis. It's actually kind of clever. These days we just print a line graph because it's more detailed. But um, I still use them for like five seconds to see if the state of the system is changing. Linux included the um, IO uh, information, uh, IO counters as part of the load averages, which actually makes it a bit... Uh, more difficult for us to understand. Other operating systems, the load averages are just the CPU runnable threads only. If the load average is greater than your CPU count, then it generally means you're going to have things queued, but it may not. Like I said, don't spend more than five seconds on that. Top or HTOP, um, it's another high level tool. I'm sure we all, we all use it. Great to just understand what uh, CPU consumers, what memory consumers there are. Most of the versions of top or HTOP don't catch short-lived processes, so if you're doing a Linux kernel build, your load average is really high, but you can't see why. Uh, ATOP is an exception because it uses the process uh, event framework so that it can display it. Um, and HTOP uh, is really configurable and you can do things like the ASCII uh, images for the CPU usage. Uh, I, I still wish some more uh, columns were added to HTOP, but uh, more things out of proc. PS, uh, classic Unix tool, and we've got a really nice uh, view here, PS1 ZFF for the ASCII art forest, where it shows the process and child relationships, and I can uh, customize fields. So basic, basic observability. VMSTAT is a, another very standard tool that comes from VSD, and I can use it to see how saturated the CPUs are for the first column. I've got the uh, basic memory statistics, 
And then just real, real averages, averages across all the CPUs for say user and system time. Uh, the first line of output has some summary since boot values, it should be all, so it's kind of partial, it's a bit hard to understand. But um, just a high level tool, what's the kernel breakdown? If I, if I say that I'm mostly system time, I know I should in investigate what the kernel's doing. If I say I'm mostly user time, I can then use application profilers. So, just a high level view. I use these high level views kind of to narrow the investigation to further tools. ISTAT, another very basic tool. is actually one of my favorites because I get to apply multiple uh, methodologies to ISTAT. So, uh, actually, I said one of my favorites, but one thing I don't like about it is it's more than 80 characters wide, which is a crime. So it doesn't fit on a slide. I have to wrap it. Anyway, the, on the left-hand side, I've got uh, roots per second, writes per second, megabytes, and so on. This is great for workload characterization, so I can see the load that's applied to the disk. Then on the right-hand side, I've got the uh, information about the latency that the, the disk is responding, the, the time spent on queues. So I can use do latency analysis based on these. I can also do a little bit of queuing theory. Uh, I can also do uh, some of my use method based on these statistics as well. So the use method, I need to know utilization, saturation, and errors. So I've got utilization there, uh, although it's not quite utilization. You never truly know the utilization of the disks. You just have an idea of how long it was busy during an interval. Uh, and for a saturation, I can look at the queue size or the, how high average uh, weight is getting as a, as a form of saturation metric. Um, it doesn't have an error column. It'd be great if it did. Then I could do the use method entirely from, uh, from ISTAT. Someone should add an error column. If you're coming up with tools yourself, I'd actually copy the ISTAT metric. It's, it's just a nice breakdown. It's a nice template. Just the way you've got the load that's applied on one side and then you've got the resulting performance on the other side. I do like it. MP stat for multiprocessor st statistics. And then I've got standard breakdowns like user, CS, steel, and so on. Uh, and I'm using that to look for, this is giving me one, lo one line per CPU, so I'm looking for unbalanced workloads or hot CPUs. Free from main memory usage, so the block device IO cache or the virtual page cache. And at the end of those basic tools, I've got some observability of the system, but there are many gaps. Intermediate tools. So for intermediate tools, that's where I'd place things like S-Trace, TCP dump, NetStat, NixDab, and so on. S-Trace, S-Trace is pretty cool. Uh, it has some really excellent translations of what syscalls are doing. As a performance engineer, I don't use it that much because of the overhead. It can slow the target by over a hundred fold because it uses the pthread framework. Uh, and that sets breakpoints so that when you enter a system call, the target thread stops, context switches to S trace, it does some work, sets up the next breakpoint, runs the syscall, holds again, and so on. It's like putting traffic metering lights on your application. Uh, it can be very helpful though, like sometimes I don't care, the, the application's burning down, I just need a quick look at what syscalls are being uh, issued, and S trace does that, that job. So in the, at the end of the day, I'm solving the problem. Uh, I did mention here it's got some timestamps. If I'm serious about system call tracing, I'll try to use one of the uh, internal buffer tracers that Linux has, like ftrace or perf events or one of the many others. TCP dump is another uh, event by event tool. I'm sure a lot of us used it, have used it all the time. Uh, and that's great for studying packet sequences with timestamps so you can really understand what a what a TCP session is doing, capture a TCP dump on a local host and the remote host, and see if the packet made it, see if it was retransmitted, and so on. Um, I don't like that it's, it's a one layer only, and I, I often want to know kernel state, but the kernel state is not on the wire, so I'll often use it in conjunction with some kernel tracing tools. It also does have CPU overhead, but there's been a lot of work to optimize that. Um, I always get nervous when people say they're running TCP dump 24 by 7 or they're using some in kernel module to effectively do the same thing. It does seem kind of crazy, but uh, so long as you've, you've benchmarked the overhead and you're, you're comfortable with that. I mean, imagine 10 gigabit, trying to do this on 10 gigabit Ethernet, uh, very busy interfaces. We might be doing a million packets a second. So just a little bit of overhead can add up. 
next step is very similar with protocol statistics and uh, it's, it's really a multi-tool, it does lots of things. Next step my says for uh, to, to give you what's going on in TCP and UDP and so on. Uh, Next step minus P is nice, it gives, me, gives us the process details. Next step is an old tool I wrote a long time ago. Um, Tim Cook put it into Linux and I kind of based this on IOSTAT. I wanted the same sort of columns. And so you've got the workload that's applied to network interfaces and then you've got the resulting performance. So you've got things like utilization and saturation metrics. So I can do the use method based on this. Pitstep is, a, is one of my real favorite tools. It's Pitstep minus T because it gives me the user and system breakdowns per thread. Uh, and then based on this, I know, I know what, what my investigation will be doing next. Do I need to go into the kernel or do I need to go into application profiles? I also like it because it doesn't clear the screen. Uh, this might just be a personal preference, but I don't like top-like tools that clear the screen. I like having the scroll back buffer, because sometimes I'll be looking at something and, and you'll see the error, you'll see the problem state once, and then the screen will refresh and you'll never see it again for like 10 minutes. You're like, oh, why did I have to clear the screen? I need, I need that screenshot. So tools like Pitstat, where I can go back in my scroll back buffer, I can capture it, I can feed it into GNU plot, that's really cool. And if you are running top tools yourself, Please is the default mode, don't clear the screen. That would, that would make me happy. Uh, swap on, I put in the intermediate group just to check swap device usage if you're using swap. Uh, LSOF in the intermediate group. I tend to think of LSOF more as a debugging tool, not a performance analysis tool. But for some applications where you're doing a file descriptor per connection, it, give, it gives you one way to investigate, am I close to the connection pool limit? So one way to look at dynamic performance. I actually prefer to just echo it out as slash proc. And then there's SAR. Uh, SAR for System Activity Recorder. Does lots and lots of things. It's actually really, I, I really like the design, uh, the way metrics have been grouped, and also the way the columns are self-descriptive. So we've got uh, transmit, kilobytes per second, so you know straight away what, what they're doing. Uh, and SAR can do archive or live mode. Uh, SAR's really cool, and, and the more you learn about SAR, the more you'll see these same metrics exposed by many other performance monitoring tools. So at this point, we've now covered S-Trace and TCP dump and SAR and, and lots of other tools. We still have some gaps. Uh, actually, no, this is, the, this is my SAR slide, sorry. This is showing what <laughs> SAR can look at. Um, so SAR's actually pretty good. It's even got minus N for fans, so I can get the... Uh, uh, what my, my system fans are doing, uh, which is excellent. Uh, there are other tools which I, which I could include in the intermediate group, things like Collectal, ATOP is pretty cool, uh, DSTAT and other measurable tools. The, the main point is the tool isn't that important, what's important is to have a way to measure everything you want. So uh, in cloud com computing environments you're probably using a monitoring product like we are, uh, might be commercial, you might develop it yourself, and the same method applies. You want, uh, you want a monitoring tool to be able to measure all the things so that you don't have to manually do that. And I included a slide like this so that you can print it out and you can use it as a scorecard for your existing monitoring tools and see how much of the system it's able to observe. You can come up with your own scorecards, it's totally different, that's fine. This is just a suggestion. But uh, if a salesman is trying to sell you an application performance monitoring tool or a system performance monitoring tool, <coughs> give them that and a pen and say, how, how much can you really observe of the system? Uh, and see how they do. And so now I've got my summary of intermediate tools and this is where we still have some gaps. We're doing pretty good. We've got S-Trace and LSOF and TCB dump in here. Advanced observability tools. Uh, that's where it place things like L-Trace, SS, IP, TRAF, each tool, and so on. Uh, CP performance counter tools, like PerfEvents, TipTop, RDMSR, uh, and lots of advanced traces. So some selected ones out of this group. So more, so <coughs> excuse me, socket statistics from SS. SS is kind of cool. We've got uh, connections and some internal kernel statistics about where the key live is on, the values it's got there. We've got a, a send, 145 megabits per second, receive space. The SS can 
can dig out more socket information than uh, you might previously know is, is actually there. IP Traff is, is interesting, is it gives me a histogram or a breakdown of packet sizes for my interfaces. So just as a way to characterize what my network interfaces are doing in terms of packet sizes. See if I'm using jumbo frames or not. I am top for doing block I.O. by process. So very quick ways to, if the disks are rattling, disks are often a source of issues even today. Uh, to see if there's some new process that you forgot about, maybe some backup <laughs> task that's rattling those disks. It's causing the problem. Slab top to look at kernel slab allocated memory usage. So it gives us the slab names on the right. So I can, I can actually see, this is kind of like top but for the, the slab allocator, the kernel slab allocator. PC stat is a new one um, I've been using recently. PC stat does page cache residency by file. It uses the uh, M in core system call to do this. Uh, and I was uh, shown this by some Cassandra database engineers because it's, it's very important for them to understand how much of the database files are actually in the cache and how well is it caching and are we doing the F advice calls properly and how, how, how much of that is working. So you can run PC stat on files and it tells you what percentage of, of them are actually cached in memory right now. It's pretty cool stuff. There's perf events, which is, uh, perf events is, is I, I've been trying to call it perf events. I know a lot of people call it just perf. The problem with perf is you can't search for perf on the internet. It matches too many things. So I'm trying to give it, use a more unique name. Perf events is under tools slash perf in the Linux code. So it's, it's, it's built in. Um, you can add it using uh, Linux tools common. It's, it's a multi-tool. It does lots of different things. Here I've just picked uh, the performance monitoring counts. So I can look at things like the stall cycles, front and back end, level one data cache loads and so on. Uh, and I would especially use that to identify CPU cycle level breakdowns. So my application is hot on CPU, okay. Uh, what is the CPU actually doing? Is it doing memory I.O. or is it doing CPU instructions? Or is it doing floating point? Or is it doing branch misprediction? What, what actually is the CPU doing? Because that information can be important. I might choose a different architecture because I know my application is mostly memory I.O. store cycles. So I might want to pin the application to a CPU and not have it walk around CPUs and do remote memory I.O. Pick a different server type. Have the application developer do zero copy, implement zero copy strategies, and so on and so on. Or if it's not store cycles, if it's actually doing just lots of instruction retires, then I'll do something else to, to optimize that. So, it's very practical. Unfortunately, the PMCs are not enabled by default in clouds yet. Uh, so uh, I, right now, on uh, now, now that I'm on Netflix, I'm doing a lot of cloud computing. I don't have direct access to them, but maybe one day there will be. It can be time consuming, even if you do have access to them. If you've done lots of, has anyone done lots of this stuff before using Perf events? So I've got some people, maybe like. Uh, Oh, maybe 12 people. If you've done this stuff before, you, you get really comfortable with the Intel and AMD uh, processor books, which are hundreds of pages long, actually uh, more than a, more, a few thousand pages long for the full Intel set, uh, which explains what each of them do. Fantastic detail, it is time consuming. Perfect things, I said it's a multi-tool, it also can sample uh, CPU stacks, and so I'll often use flame graphs as a visualization for perf CPU samples. Flame graphs is just this small program I put on GitHub that will read the output of perf events. And so I've got the uh, stack depth on the y-axis, and I've just got the population on the x-axis. And it's interactive, I can mouse over events and it shows me details. The width is proportional to how many, uh, how often that stack frame was present in the profile. So as a performance engineer, I can quickly profile it and say, uh, okay, so you've got like 10% of time in GC, we've got 5% of time in locks, I can look at how much time I'm spending in kernel TCPIP, and I can quantify speed up, which can help direct performance tuning efforts very quickly. On this e over there as well. On this broken Java stacks, because we're still missing the frame pointer, I wish our hotspot wouldn't ditch the frame pointer because I need my, I, I want both events to work on Java stacks. <laughs> TipTop is another cool tool that uses the PMCs. Anyone use TipTop? 
So Tip Top is, uh, I believe, believe it was written uh, by someone in France, and it's fairly recent. It gives you a, a top-like view. It has columns like uh, instructions per cycle, we've got miss, bus, uh, cycles. It's really cool. It doesn't need some love. Uh, I can't use it yet because it's not, I don't have PMCs in the cloud. But uh, uh, like I said about the, the manuals being thousands of pages long and it might take you all day to read through the Intel manual, when people write, write things like TikTok, you don't have to, you just run TikTok, which is great. So I, I like to see tools like that. There's another set of performance monitoring counters that CPUs provide, apart from P PMCs. Uh, PMCs have all the cool stuff like level 1 cache misses, install cycles, and so on. RD uh, MSRs for the modern specific registers, these, they're fairly limited. Uh, they've got things like timestamp clock, temperature power. Uh, what I like about them is they're more likely to be available in cloud environments. And so I found that they, these exist in the Zen guests that we have. And so I was able to write tools like actually show me the real CPU clock rate that's going on because Turbo Boost can vary the clock rate. And if I'm doing performance comparisons between systems, I need to know the actual clock rate, otherwise my error margin could be 30% or something ridiculous. So it's great that we can use MSRs to do that. Uh, I can also do things like CPU temperature straight from the MSRs. Uh, you can fiddle with MSRs directly using uh, the MSR tools package. There's RD MSR and uh, write MSR. Some other advanced tools worth mentioning, LTRACE, ETHTOOL, We've also added PMU tools, it's pretty cool. PMU tools is another set of tools based on top of the performance monitoring counters, which like I said, it's great because it's, it's hard to do this, uh, it's time consuming just to do this stuff on your, on your own. Um, and it allows you to do, a, I already mentioned uh, how much of a fan I was of methodologies. Intel has a methodology called top-down methodology, which is how you look at CPU, uh, CPU cycles and understanding where they are in the front end and the back end and, and getting a good hang on them. So pinging new tools actually helps you apply that methodology, which is great. There are many advanced traces. And uh, so many options on Linux like PerfEvents, Ftrace, EPPF. Uh, most of them can do static and dynamic tracing. So static tracing is where I have predefined events and dynamic tracing is where I can instrument anything. And these are catch-all. I don't, I don't like the tracers, but I don't use them straight away. I'll, I'll go and use top and iostat if, if that solves the job. Uh, but if I need to, I'll go and use the advanced ones. I have a section at the end just on that. So now, we've covered the basic, intermediate, and advanced. And my, my slide is getting quite full of stuff. That's just observability tools. To summarize benchmarking tools, so, there are some uh, multi-benchmarking suites like UnixBench and LMBench and SysBench. Uh, Perf has Bench as a subcommand as well. Uh, file system ones, application ones, and networking ones. Before I show any of these, I, I want to say that I've come up with a methodology to help people. Benchmarking is the most error-prone activity in IT I know of. Everyone who does benchmarking, including myself, will just get it wrong. It's so easy to come up with results that are just, they look okay, but they're misleading. Uh, because we have, we have no intu intuition about benchmarking. If I said, hey, I've got this thermometer, and it says that the temperature in this room is 4,000 degrees Celsius, you'd say, well, that's wrong. <laughs> this thermometer's garbage. It's broken. But if I gave you a benchmarking tool and said, this benchmarking tool says you do 4,000 MIDI mops per second, then you have no intuition about this. So it's very common for people to have absolutely ridiculous numbers and not be able to identify it because you have no experience. So if I was to summarize all the mistakes and come up with one methodology to help you out, that would be active benchmarking. When you run a benchmarking tool, configure it so that it will actually run for hours, if not days, and then go and use the previous observability tools to confirm that it's doing what it's supposed to do. And so go and run top and uh, TCP dump and the tracing tools and all of those tools. If you're benchmarking the CPUs, run perf events and see what the CPUs are actually doing. If you're benchmarking the network, go and run netstat and nixstat and make sure it's doing what it's supposed to do. If you think you're benchmarking the disks, go and run iostat and see if the disks are doing anything. Because a very common issue is you're actually hitting out of the file system cache, not even touching the disks. 
And so this can all be summarized as active benchmarking. When the benchmark is running, actually go and use observability tools, all the previous ones I mentioned. Just to pick a few benchmarking tools, uh, a few of my favorites, LNBench is a benchmarking suite. This one is doing uh, memory read latency, and I've plotted it in R size versus latency, and it's really nice because I can see there's my level 1 cache, level 2 cache, level 3 cache, and main memory access latencies. Uh, these are both logarith logarithmic axes. Um, the way these are kind of even is testament to the Intel designers. I'm sure they've, they've optimized it to be, that's, that must be the efficient pattern of spreading out size versus latency for those caches. It's really cool stuff. FIO is probably currently my favorite for doing file system or disk IO benchmarks for a number of reasons. It gives me uh, an idea into latency distributions, although I do prefer a full histogram in case it's multimodal, which it often is. Uh, other, other things I like about FIO is that it allows you to apply non-uniform access distributions. The big problem with benchmarking tools is they will just do a uniform access distribution, or sequential, and that's not how real-world tools work. Real-world tools have hot data and not, not so hot, and then cold data, and FIO can simulate that. PCHAR is... Uh, well, I'd love to encourage someone to fix PCHAR. PCHAR is like Traceroute, although it will experimentally test the links and then show you the throughput, the bandwidth, in between each hop of Traceroute, which is fantastic, although the tool kind of doesn't need some love. It was originally called PathChar and written by Van Jacobson, who also wrote Traceroute. So he wrote PathChar afterwards, which is like even better than Traceroute. Uh, but for some reason it didn't catch on and, and people haven't heard about it. Uh, but there is PCHAR, which exists for Linux, and um, well, that doesn't need a bit of love. I haven't had it work that successfully, but it's one of my favorite benchmarking tools. So there'll be a summary of, of various benchmarking tools you can use. Like I said, Ellen, Ellen Bench and SysBench and Unix Bench are these multi-tools that can do many things. That's benchmarking tools. Uh, the last, uh, the, the next set of tools is tuning tools, and for tuning, there are generic interfaces, so sysctl and slash sys. Applications generally have their own config, um, and then it depends on what area you're doing. So CPU scheduler, storage IO, network, or dynamic. Uh, there's ways to do dynamic patching as well in terms of tuning. To start with the methodology as well, uh, for tuning, uh, the scientific method works. So before I'm, I'm tuning something, have I thought of a question and a hypothesis that I want to, want to then test uh, with my, by actually changing the tunable, what's my prediction, what will the analysis be? Are there any observational or benchmarking tests you can try before tuning? So tuning, think of tuning as the last thing you can do, uh, try observing it first, see if you can prove that that's an issue before you go and flip the, the tunable. Because with tuning things there are risks, so I might hurt the production workload. On the other hand, it is a balance. Sometimes there are some areas where it's just too tricky to observe, and just changing the tunable is the most practical way to uh, investigate an area. Uh, so just to draw the tuning tools on a map like this, I would have it like this. Uh, U-limit, nice, really nice task set for <coughs> doing groups of CPUs and so on. Now the last set of tools before I do tracing is static tools. And Static performance tuning is, a, is yet another methodology. Uh, this one has existed for a while, and uh, it's where you check the static trace and configuration of the system. So the previous groups of tools look at how the system is behaving for a workload that's applied. Imagine you turn off the workload. So system's idle. What can you check? Is there anything useful you can check? There's lots of useful things you can check. You can check if the disks are full. When disks get to like 99% full, depends on the file system, they can actually perform worse as it's trying to find places to put data. Uh, but you don't need the workload running to check that. Uh, CPU types, like what type of CPUs are we actually on that we might have accidentally uh, deployed on an older server. Storage devices, file system and volume configuration and so on. So that's the last group of tools, static tools, and I've got a separate uh, diagram just for that. And that includes things like LSPCI, LSBlock, LSHW, CPUID, and so on. 
just so that you can get a hang on the static <laughs> configuration of the system, see if anything's misplaced there. The last section is on tracing. And to start with, so tracing is, is like I said, the, the catch-all, the advanced observability tools. There are trace points in the kernel, and these, these are static, so they uh, they consider stable interfaces, and so they shouldn't really change. And they're great things to learn. The kernel engineers have kind of left them like breadcrumbs so that we can find our ways around, don't have to read all, all of the source code. So they're, they're really helpful to have. And I've decorated just this uh, basic picture with where some of the groups of trace points are. So we try to use trace points first if they can do the job because they're, they're generally stable. And if trace points can't do the job, then I'll go and use something dynamic like U-probes or K-probes, which can then fill in all the gaps and instrument the actual, any function call. Uh, these are unstable, so if I write a script that works for Linux 3.2, it may not work on Linux 3.3 or 3.17, uh, because I'm instrumenting the actual source code. But the fact that I can do it at all is great, and solve issues this way. As for tracing tools, there are lots. Uh, I've got nine, a list of nine on this diagram, and all of the, the logos for the tracing tools. There's actually probably too many choices of tracing tools in Linux right now, and many are still in development. But um, I want to imagine Linux with tracing. So with a programmable tracer, now I've done a lot of dtrace before, I, I wrote, um, I've got a MacBook and like ISOOP and all of the things I wrote in the past. And dtrace really um, let me see what you can do with tracing. You can do things like, with iOSnoop, I can look at event by event. I've got my title, the start and end timestamps for this block I.O. There's the latency, and take that information and plot it. iOSnoop is a great tool because I've got a usage message with minus H. It's one of my uh, most popular dtrace tools. I.O. latency, so I can do a histogram of latency uh, so I can quickly look for multimodal distributions. That's probably disk, so about 8 to 64 milliseconds. That's disk, uh, platter, reads, or writes. And then this is cache hits. So a great way to summarize latency. Open snoop for look, looking at which files are being opened at the Cisco interface, very useful, very handy. So I've got a, a list there. Quickly find out where my config files and log files are. Funk graph for going in and out of kernel functions and looking at latency. K-probe for looking at actual uh, kernel function calls and their arguments. But wait a minute, I'm not actually demonstrating my dtrace tools like I, I normally do. All of these tools are running on Linux. All of these tools are using existing Linux capabilities, they're all using ftrace. So I've actually been busy since I came to Netflix porting my dtrace tools to Linux. And I'm just using whatever whatever works. So I'll use uh, I'll use Perfence, Ftrace, LTTNG, System Tap. I'll use whatever can get the job done. And I've found that Ftrace can actually get the job done quite a lot of the time. So it's been pretty interesting. So getting back to these tools, even though iOSNOOP is a very popular dtrace tool, this is using Ftrace, and this is running on Linux. I've put this on GitHub, um, and so I can look at latency. I've got my summarized uh, summarizing latency as a histogram. This one's interesting because it's using the ftrace function graphing capability. So you can see as you go in and out of functions, and it also shows me the latency as I go through kernel functions. This is a great way to explore the kernel and understand who calls what, and get my head around kernel internals quickly. Kprobe uses the kprobe interface, and so I can say things like kprobe, this function, this argument, so take percent si and cast it as a file name, uh, call it a file name, cut, cut, make it a string, uh, and also do a filter. So only if a file name contains uh, ends in stat. And that filter is applied in kernel using kprobes. And so I'm now dynamically instrumenting, uh, so Postgres went and called do sys open, and there's the file name that's printing out. When I control C, the script cleans it up and then uh, shuts down ftrace and kprobes. Really cool stuff. So I didn't think that this stuff was just possible in existing Linux, but it has been for many, many years. There just hasn't been uh, examples of this style before, writing little tools uh, that I like doing. 
So, imagine when we do some tracing, but well, it already has tracing. Uh, we've got F-Trace and lots of other tracing. F-Trace is built into the kernel. Uh, that was added by Stephen Rostat and others since 2627. Uh, there's the F-Trace cube, uh, F-Trace pony logo. D-Trace has had a, a pony logo for a long time. So, uh, Stephen only found out about that yesterday. Uh, it's already enabled on our servers, so it's great because at Netflix we can use F-Trace to solve issues right now, and that's what we're doing. And I've been writing some front-end tools to aid usage. Uh, there's also Trace CMD by Stephen, uh, which has a different uh, method of usage which you might like. So far, I've only written a few, so I've got more to do. My tools are kind of hacks because I'm missing some capabilities, and so even though they get the job done, they're not, I wouldn't call them robust tools. Uh, as F-Trace and kernel capabilities enhance, I can make the tools better. Uh, just to quickly summarize some other tools, uh, perf events, at the, the perf command is also in the Linux source code, and it's a powerful multi-tool. I mentioned that earlier. It does all sorts of things like sampling. I can do CPU flame graphs. We do CPU flame graphs using perf events in Netflix like almost every day uh, to, to get an understanding of where CPU time is spent and quantify it very quickly. It's not very programmable yet, but that might improve with eBPF. Uh, just to pick one perfect events example, I'm tracing a trace point, uh, consume socket buffer, and showing the kernel stack trace that led to it. eBPF, <coughs> that's a new capability uh, that it extends BPF. It's a terrible name, we need to come up with a better name. Uh, at least it has a cute little logo so far. Uh, it's high performance filtering and it allows us to do in kernel summaries. And so, just as one example, this BPF program is doing a histogram, but that's incremented in kernel where it's very efficient. And so, uh, I, can, I can go and fetch that every second from the kernel and, and understand custom latency, uh, which is really cool. I can do, say, latency heat maps using eBPF and build uh, monitoring tools based on it. There is system tap and uh, at Netflix, at the moment, I'm trying to get things done using F-Trace and then Perf Events, but I will go and use the other traces uh, as needed. System Tap uh, can use USDT probes, and so we're using it for, say, the Java hotspot uh, provider probes. Uh, and it's also it's quite an advanced tracer. I keep using it on other operating systems. I'm told it works really well on Red Hat, which is where the developers work. Um, I keep trying it on Ubuntu and uh, have had challenges in the past, but it's been getting better. Make sure you're on the latest version. KTAP is another one. Uh, K KTAP is another advanced tracer. It looked really promising. Uh, and you could write some very advanced scripts, very fast, designed for uh, lightweight environments. After it was suggested to integrate with EPPF, which would be pretty awesome, um, there hasn't been many updates to KTAP, so I don't know if that project is still moving forward, but it was very promising at the time. And then Cystic is a, a, another new one. Cystic is innovative new tracer. We can do simple expressions like TCP dump, and I think it seems like it like might be a reasonable replacement for S-Trace. And I wrote a chisel file slower, so I can look at events slower than a particular uh, interval, so or, or latency threshold. It's kind of cool to see a, a, a new innovation in the tracing space like uh, Cystic. Cystic currently only does syscalls, so, and, and also does processing and user level. So it would be interesting to see if they uh, do more of the kernel trace points or dynamic tracing or not. If they don't, then they've come up with a pretty good tool that can replace S-Trace. So the present and future, right now, F-Trace is pretty good, um, serving many needs. There are some things they can't do. So F-Trace can't do in kernel aggregations, which is probably the biggest thing I, I'd like it to do where I can do, say, a custom histogram in the kernel of latency. Uh, Perf events can do more, especially with debug info, and then ad hoc will go and use things like system tap and ktap. In the future, uh, eBPF may, uh, as it's getting integrated into the kernel, may play a bigger role, as it will let me do these custom in-kernel aggregations. I'll summarize the current tracing landscape kind of like this, doing scope and capability versus ease of use, from brutal to less brutal, so, uh, EPPF is actually pretty hard to use right now. Uh, the assembly mode is really hard. The C mode is kind of better. But for most of us, we'll just use front end tools built on top of it. So, the capability is what's important. And the capability is pretty good. 
So I'd summarize all of the tools, the observability tools like that, but there are three other groups of tools I went through very briefly. So observability is, is just one way of understanding the system. You've also got benchmarking where you can do your own custom experiments. You've got tuning where you can change things. And then you've got the static performance tools where you're looking at the cold state of the server. And so, if all of that seems overwhelming, don't worry, you can start with the questions, the methodology that guides you through your use of tools. And the other thing is, the point of this talk is not so that you remember all the tools, but just so that you remember that these things are just capable in the first place. Because you, th then you'll look them up later when you actually need them. And that's my talk. Thank you. Before lunch, uh, we've got some time for questions. I don't know if there's a spare microphone. Anyone have any questions? You can also see me during lunch as well. Yes, at the back. Have you ever tried running the industrials on different architecture than I can see? Which specific tools? In BKN, it's like, well, actually, it's still in, so I don't know if the technology can come and Right. Uh, I haven't had a chance to try them. Some of the tools I know are wedded to x86. And so um, some of my F-trace tools, I really try not to do this. Like for example, if I, if I want to do dynamic tracing with a kernel function, I'll try to do the return and then dollar $retval, because that's architecture independent. But sometimes I have to do the entry. And so if I'm doing the entry, I'm doing things like percent DX, Suddenly that's very architecture specific. And so in the, I, I'm very conservative. I try everything not to do this. And if I have to use a register, I will only use one register so it's easy to maintain the script. And if someone needs to point to a different architecture, they can. But anyway, if you try to run some of these tools on other architectures, you'll hopefully it will be a small amount of maintenance, and not a large amount. Because I didn't have thought about it. Other questions? Yes, yes. What about tools in virtual environments? Um, have you specifically measured the end regarding those? So, what was that, the throughput in virtual environments? Yeah. So, these days I'm running everything in virtual environments. I'm running everything in the same guests. And uh, there's just two challenges with that. One is the hypervisor. And so, any network IO code path is going to be slow, and so uh, micro-benchmarking becomes important. Although um, Zen and KVM and other, other uh, hypervisors these days have done a lot of work for performance improvements and to do interrupt coalescing and all of that. Um, so that's also hard. Uh, the only hard problem right now is getting access to the PMCs, the performance monitoring counters, because I need them to do things like cycle analysis, stall cycles, and whatever. It's a very virtual game. And there was another question, to the same question? Uh, yes, then. What uh, My opinion about Valgrind, it's okay, but um, it's, uh, I mean, it's great as a super last resort. I, if you're a developer, it's, it's going to be something you're going to use to nail a bunch of issues. Uh, the overheads, I, I deal with a lot of production workloads, and so the overheads are too high to use it. Uh, but, if you can simulate things in, de in development where it's not, not so much of a deal, um, then that can be quite useful for solving things. It's just not something I use that often because I'm always in production. Yes? Uh, are you sure uh, check out Lang address sanitizer? It only has an override of by a factor of two. So Sorry, what was I checking out? The uh, Clang address sanitizer does uh, pretty much the same thing as Valgrind and only has an overhead of uh, by a factor of two. Oh, so Clang has a, a Valgrind type analyzer with only a, a factor of two overhead. That's pretty good. Because Valgrind, the factor can be very, very big. Yep. But uh, Clang is, I'll have to check that out. Thanks. It's uh, interesting. Other questions? Okay, so I guess we can break for lunch, and you're welcome to ask me questions afterwards. My slides are on SlideShare, so um, you can download them. Some people asked me to uh, put the put a license on the images, so I put a common criteria, so people can take the images and like print them out and stick them on their office walls or whatever. So, 
Thanks. Thanks.